Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, today, I'll be talking about S frame and S graph, about scalable external memory data structures for tables and graphs. Uh, my name is Jay Gu. Uh, I'm co founder and now engineer at uh, Dado. Uh, prior to that, I have a master's degree in machine learning from Carnegie Mellon University, study under uh, Professor Carlos Question. Uh, I was part of, uh, I worked on uh, distributed graph partitioning and uh, distributed graph algorithms and was the co-author of the Power Graph paper for OSDI 2012. Um, a few words about Dado. We were formerly known as Graph Lab. We changed our name this January. I was founded in 2013, two years ago, in Seattle and by Carlos and his grad students, including me. And our mission is to accelerate the creation of intelligent applications. Um, <coughs> so a little bit of uh, history for this pro uh, for, for the GraphLab project. The first version of uh, GraphLab started in uh, 2010 with the goal of paralyzing um, graph analytics algorithms and uh, uh, graphical model belief propagation algorithms in, on, in a single machine using shared memory architecture. And two years later, we extend the shared memory architecture into a distributed setting, but with a different focus on natural graphs with power law degrees. And at the same time, uh, another student from the lab, Apple, who developed a graph chi, which is the same idea of power graph, but implemented on a single Mac mini with external memory support. And GraphG becomes extremely popular because it's so easy to use without any uh, setup for cluster. Just run on single Mac Mini, um, <coughs> slightly slower, but ex scale, uh, scale to the same uh, uh, size of the problem. And after that, uh, Joey, Joseph Gonzalez, uh, came here uh, at the, to the AMP lab, developed a power graph abstraction on top of Spark, which is known as GraphX today. And today at Dato, we, our product is called GraphLab Create, which does a way more beyond graph. That's also part of the reason why we changed the name from GraphLab to Dato. We deal with uh, scalable uh, tables and graphs, images and text data. We provide high level machine learning algorithms. We also provide uh, production uh, tools for uh, deploying machine learning in production. Okay, this is about the history. Let me begin with the, t the rest of the talk with a tweet from the data, the, the data conference or the data science summit. A tweet that begins with that, uh, data scientists spend a lot of time cleaning about data and the rest of the time complaining about cleaning <laughs> data. Right? There are clear pain points about dealing with the size of data today. The first pain point is that um, the data is normally bigger than the memory. And when you run out of memory, your machine freezes. It's swapping data back and forth. There's absolutely nothing you can do about it. So some people uh, uh, deal with this problem by subsample the data. But this introduces uh, unnecessary uncertainties to your model. It also introduces overhead of data management. How do I manage this version of sample, that version of sample? How do I, uh, what do I call the, the version where I do the average at the end, right? Another uh, approach is to use big data systems, distributed systems. However, it comes with big overhead. Uh, every time you do Hadoop fs-ls, you waste three seconds. Every time you submit a Hive query, you know it's time to go for a long walk and take, take a break. And also, um, the cluster has a shared resource uh, with a limited size of containers. So if your job exceeds memory, it got killed. When you come back from the long walk, you find out your job got killed or failed, which is extremely annoying and unproductive. So I think those pa uh, these pain points are because of the lack of fast, scalable, and easy to use external memory data structures. Ask yourself this question, would I be more productive if I can analyze lots of data without doing subsampling, using just my laptop at an interactive speed? Is it even possible? If we want to make this possible, we need to push the limit of single machine in terms of its performance, scalability, and usability. And that's the theme of today's talk. 
To understand the single machine scalability, it's important to understand the storage hierarchy. So here we have spinning disk, SSD, and memory. The throughput of them is on memory, you can, anal uh, you can get about 10 gigs of throughput, and on disks, it's usually about orders of hundreds of megabytes per second. However, the capacity of them uh, goes in the reverse order. On disk, you can store up to like 10 terabytes of data, which is um, usually enough for uh, a lot of data sets for a single machine. The caveat is that random access on disks is extremely slow. So we want to avoid that. A good external memory data structure for machine learning um, needs to uh, incorporate this knowledge about the system storage hierarchy. So the, in the rest of the talk, it's divided into three parts. I first talk about S-Frame, which is scalable tabular manipulation, and then followed by S-Graph, the same, uh, same uh, ex which extends uh, the table architecture to deal with graph data. And lastly, I will talk about how do we extend the single machine external memory data structure into a distributed setting. So your data usually begins with tables, rows, or rows in the inside tables. For example, Netflix data, user movie rating is a row, is a record. However, when you deal with data, doing data engineering or cleaning up, typically you're doing columnar transformations. For instance, we can uh, take the rating column and divide by the total sum to normalize it. We can create a new column called rating squared, uh, which is the square value of each of the rating. We can also subselect two columns through the rest of our way and call it a new data set. These are all columnar uh, <coughs> operations. So in S-frame, column is the first class citizen. We call S-array, a scalable array. It represents a single typed column. It's backed by disk and it's immutable. By immutable, what I mean is, once the S array is generated, you write to the disk once and never changes it. This is extremely important, and I will talk about that later. So today's, uh, we, today we live in an exciting moment where they are, the data becomes extremely rich. Right? We have text data, image data, we have uh, voice data, different kinds. And data can come in structured format, like CSV, or semi-structured format as JSON. So S-Array supports integer type, flow type, the traditional numerical type. Array of floats, where you want to analyze a chunk of uh, uh, numerical values. Strings for text data. Daytime for time series. An image uh, <coughs> for image analysis or deep learning. In addition to all those single types, it also supports a, a list type of arbitrary types that I mentioned above. So you can have a list type of uh, SRA where each cell is a list of like integers, strings, integer and strings, etc. And we have dictionaries, which is mainly used for support bag of words, sparse representations, and uh, JSON. Here's an example. This is the Yelp review data set. First column is business ID, it's a hash string. And we have date time, we have integer values. This is the text about reviews. This is the, and we have votes, which is a dictionary type uh, with string as key and integer as value. It's funny, useful, uh, the counts of uh, how many votes to each of different type of uh, uh, categories. And here we have list, a list of strings, uh, which is a, a which tells you what are the types that a, uh, a single restaurant falls into, right? So having a S array, which, which can support a different type of, a type of data, give you the capability, reduce the needs for uh, doing data engineering or type conversion. Basically, you can just store the data right there and, doing, uh, and perform uh, operations on the data. So, Knowing what an S array is, an S frame is just simply, the concept of, of S frame is just a dictionary which maps your column name to the, to the S array. 
So this is the internal representation. You have an S frame with three columns. User column points to the S array, which stores the data for user ID, similar for movie and rating. Let's have another S frame, similar, three columns. So if I want to uh, assign a new column in the first S frame with uh, and a column from the second S frame, all I do is create a new entry in the dictionary and points to the other S array on disk. It's essentially free. When I want to take a difference of two S arrays, I, I perform a vectorized operation minus taking these two S array and generate a new anonymous S array called diff. I can assign this diff back to the first S frame and basically adding a new en entry which points to this anonymous S array. So this is where lazy evaluation becomes, uh, this is where the immutability of S array becomes very important. Because once S array is written, it, you know it's never going to change. Therefore, you can just use these pointer operations to do the proper assignment. What's the scalability of S frame? Today, the largest synthetic S frame we have, we have uh, created or played with has 950 columns and 10 billion rows. That amounts to 10 trillion dense numerical values. And in fact, there's really no row limits on the num uh, <coughs> number of row limits on S frame. You can have as many rows as you want, as long as you have enough disk space. And there is a, s a small column uh, limitation, which is uh, between 100 and 1,000 of columns. The reason of that is each column or each group of columns actually corresponds to a file, right? S array is backed by a file. Therefore, there is a number of file handle limit uh, on the OS, so we cannot have uh, that many columns. However, when you have more than 1,000 columns, it's either machine generated or it can be stored as a list or sparse dictionary format. So essentially reduce 1,000 column to one column is good for most of the problem. Let me show you this uh, biggest S frame uh, in real. Okay. Okay. So this is on a single EC2 instance, R3.8x uh, large. It has quite a lot of memory and uh, disk, uh, disk space for this uh, for this demo purpose. If you only have like maybe one billion rows, uh, you can run this demo on the laptop. So let's we begin by load this uh, S frame. This is, a uh, this is a file, or essentially a directory. It's a big biological data set, synthetically generated. And uh, we assign it equals to data. We finish it instantly because it doesn't perform any operation rather than opening a file handle. It has 950 columns and uh, 93 billion rows. Right. And then let's take, uh, take a quick look at the contents. It's a bunch of uh, numerical columns. Y is the response columns. These are the different type of um, annotations. We have integer columns, float columns, etc. When you type data, all it does is it prints the first 10 rows. So it doesn't read the entire data at all. We can try to, try to calculate the variance of a particular t column on 10 billion rows. It finished really quickly because the data is stored in one column. All you do is scan that column on disk and compute the variance. We can create a new feature by uh, taking the all operation of two columns. 
and perform a sum on it. And we can remove a column, which is essentially free. OK, so this is the uh, uh, scalability of SRAM. So our chief architecture, Yu Chen Lo, actually did a crazy thing, which scales all of the NumPy array to the same scal <laughs> scalability of our SRAM. So this is what it looks like in real. Import NumPy as NT. So this is the NumPy you would normally use, pip install NumPy. Or, and all we do is import graphlab.numpy. This line doesn't do, do much. I will tell you about the magic it does later. What we do is we dump the entire S-frame, the data, with uh, 10 billion rows and 900 columns into a NumPy array. When we print out the NumPy data, it's actually NumPy's NumPy array. And it has shape. 93 billion columns, uh, uh, <coughs> nine, 9 billion uh, rows and 1,000 columns. This is the largest NumPy array ever created. If you calculate the amount of memory it would took for a NumPy array to be this big, it would cost 6 terabytes of data, uh, 6 terabytes of memory. We can do uh, subselecting and indexing of NumPy array as you would. We can, um, we can change the values of a NumPy array. This, this changes all the values in the first row to be 1. And can, we can run scikit-learn models on it. For demo purpose, I, uh, we sub-selected a part of the NumPy array, <coughs> but actually it runs on the, full number, uh, on, the, on the full data as well. It just take a little bit longer. So remember this, uh, this option, shuffle equals false. This is very important, which I will cover later. All right, we have a scale, we automatically scale NumPy array um, to the size of the s frame we have, and we can run cyclic model on it. This entire NumPy array is backed by disk on, uh, by, by S frame on disk. Okay, going back to the presentation. Now let's do a deep dive into the actual, uh, the some technical details about S frame and the secret sauces uh, of how it's fast, scalable, and uh, easy to use. The first secret sauce is the lazy evaluation and query optimization. Essentially, when you have data that big, and when S frame is a uh, when S array is an immutable um, file, you want to minimize the number of times you create a new S array, actually a physical S array on disk. You, want, you, you don't want to write um, S array as often as, it, as you could. This is different from if you have the data structure in memory. And <coughs> what legacy evaluation does is, uh, when, you build a, when you call a series of operation or transformation on external memory data structure, it actually remembers the operation. It does not evaluate it uh, immediately until you actually want to consume it. You want to see the output. And even when you ask for the result at the end, it only does as much compute as you asked. For instance, if I have a uh, S array, I do pl uh, plus 2, plus 3, and plus 5, they will, be, they will build a chain graph with all these operations. And at the end, if I only asked for the top 10, the first 10 rows of this S frame or S array, it only does plus 2, plus 5, plus 3 on the first 10 elements. So there's essentially no materialization of the S array during this operation. This is what we call lazy evaluation. So this is a more uh, sophisticated example. We load a S frame, which corresponds to an operator called S frame source. 
And if you select a column called S frame rating, and it does a it, this is a projection uh, operator. And you do uh, you do ratings times two. This is a transformation uh, operator on an array. And then finally, if you uh, <coughs> let's uh, assign it back, this corresponds to a projection and a union. It's a binary operator. Now this is our S frame. Nothing has been uh, created or written yet. So finally, you ask about what's the sum of this rating. And it corresponds to another project and the reduce. So what we can do is we just stream all the data from S frame source, pump them through all these operators. And the final, the final result is just a single value. During this process, no S array has been created on this. Furthermore, we can simplify this, quer uh, this query graph or query plan, like what um, database people do. We can move the, we can combine the projection and the uh, union. We can combine project with, uh, with the source node. And this is the simplified graph. It avoids a lot of unnecessary computation because all you ask is about sum of one S array after it's being transformed. So there is a ri very rich set of uh, query optimization that we can borrow from a database community. For example, if you have a filter operator, like selecting a few rows for a criteria, we want to push this filter operator as up as possible so that the downstream has only a few data, has fewer data. We also want to project, uh, pushing the project op operator upward so that you, <laughs> you, have, you end up with less columns and also uh, drawing ordering, et cetera. So this is uh, another crazy example of an unoptimized query plan and an optimized query plan. This is generated for te stress testing our query planner. So comparing to other system, um, the S frame from GraphLab create is, um, is actually quite fast. So this is the, uh, one of the benchmark from the AMP lab. What it does is it, it, does sele it selects two columns and does a filter on it. And then we can perform as fast as um, Redshift or Impala, those in memory uh, system. And this is not the end of story. We run on one machine where all of them runs on five machines. So the second secret uh, source is what we call type aware compression. The benefit of storing your data in a column order is that all, of, all the values in the columns are of the same type. So you can actually have a, a specific compression algorithms that to, to, to that type. For integer values, we use a framework of reference encoding, basically what's the difference to the minimum value. We also use a delta encoding, which is the incremental difference. So if you only have a binary column, uh, we only store um, only store ones or zeros. <coughs> For floating point values, we cast it to integer and just reuse the integer encoding. For string values, um, if there are the num number of unique values in that column is small, we use dictionary encoding. Essentially, you just um, assign each unique value a number, and then you become, it becomes integer. Of course, for image column, we can use uh, JPEG or PNG encoding, which is much more efficient than storing the image as a 2D dense array. So these compression will bring down the data size dramatically. If you have a, uh, looking at this Netflix data set a few years ago, which is really big data, 100 million rows and three integer columns. If you store it in raw format, in raw text format, it's about 1.4 gigabytes. If you load them in Pandas data frame, it's actually three gigabytes because Pandas data frame has all those indexing overhead. In S frame, it only costs 160 megabytes. It's one, about one tenth of the size. And also S frame is on disk. So it consumes absolutely zero memory. S frame's compression actually does better than GZIP because GZIP does not have type aware um, compression. It only treats your data as rows. In this Netflix data set, um, it's actually sorted by the uh, movie ID. 
Therefore, the movie column itself is extremely efficient after compressed. So now let's look, um, look back at the storage hierarchy picture that we had a few slides ago. These are the actual, uh, actual throughput. But with a compression that has 10x, <coughs> brings them down your data size to 10x smaller, the effective throughput of them actually increased by a, an order of magnitude, which uh, narrows the gap between external memory speed and the in-memory speed. OK. However, with just the external memory data structure, it's not enough. Remember that shuffle equals false option in the demo. And disk, a random access in disk is very expensive. Well, we know that existing uh, machine learning algorithms usually contains a lot of random access, which kills the performance even when you have this efficient external memory data structure. This calls for a rethink of a lot of machine learning algorithms and data scientists or uh, data engineering operators. For instance, do you need sample? We don't want random access. We want sequential. We prefer sequential access. Now, do you need sampling of your data? If you do, how do you implement the sampling algorithm by using sequential access only? We want to avoid sort and shuffle operators as much as possible. Try, hard very, uh, <coughs> try very hard not to do sort and shuffle. And how about space decomposition tree? Tree, external memory tree data structure. How do you implement that? That's a very interesting research question. So um, um, for machine learning task on a single machine, uh, we actually performs better than one of the Berkeley uh, project Bitmark. They use the GPU node. For this uh, competition, uh, Kaggle competition for uh, at click, a click-through rate prediction on the critical data set with 46 million rows and 34 million sparse coefficients. The, uh, the bitmap runs 10 iterations of SGD in 800 seconds, whereas we run 10 iterations of LBFGS, which is more expensive than SGD, in only about um, 500 seconds. This is not a compute-bound task. Therefore, GPU doesn't help much here. And the throughput of external memory, efficient external memory data structure is the key to the performance. So we talked about performance and scalability. Uh, we built S-Frame also uh, with usability in mind. It has a Py in Python interface, and the R interface is coming soon. It's built with a lightning fast CSV parser to help you bring the data in as quickly as possible. With the, with <coughs> with the crazy JSON support, if you have a CSV column, which is a JSON string, it automatically parses it into a dictionary type. Um, <coughs> it has nice integration with NumPy and Pandas. You guys have seen it. Also, has, can bring the data from database using ODBC driver and Spark RDDs. We also implement a lot of um, common op uh, operations that as data scientists would like. <sighs> like, for example, the mean, max, and quantiles of the column, and the number of unique values of a categorical column using a one-pass streaming sketch. Essentially, you make one pass of the column and compute all these values at once. It also comes with nice visualization. So in summary, uh, S-Frame is this compressed column table, which we built for fast and scalable and easy to use. Uh, it supports rich data types. <coughs> for the easier for use. And uh, the uh, technical wise, we use a columnar architecture with the benefit of uh, type aware compression, lazy evaluation, and for easy feature engineering. So let me take a quick pause here. And if you guys have any questions about S frames, I can try to answer before I move on to the S graph. Um, you can read the data from ODBC into a S-frame and dump into the, uh, 
You mean the Python binding? Yes. Yeah, when the, when the Python binding. Yes. Yeah, SVM, uh, the entire code is, the backend is implemented C++. Uh, Python is our ma main uh, front-end language. Have you looked at Jython 7? No. Yes. Um, not yet. <laughs> Supporting uh, different languages is always um, a common request, but we actually have a, a queue of prioritization. And also Java is a little bit different uh, than R or Julia, those kind of, uh, which are easier to bind than Java. Hmm? What language is it? Oh, the language, is, it's written in C++. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about graph. So tables are not the only data, data format you would encounter in the analysis. Graph is becoming extremely more and more popular thanks to those social network. Graph encodes relationship between people, facts, products, interests, and ideas. Graphs can be really big. Um, for, for instance, in 2012, Facebook has 1 billion users and 144 billion friendship. Twitter uh, had a 15 billion follower address. And S-Graph is, is built for uh, immutable disk-backed graph representation. It can store arbitrary uh, attributes on vertices and edges. It is optimized for bulk access, but not for uh, fine-grained queries. When you compare S-Graph to uh, graph databases like uh, Neo4j or Titan, which uh, support fine-grained queries, they like uh, give me all the neighbors of this single vertices. S-Graph is not built for that. It is not optimized for small queries and fine-grained queries. However, it's built for uh, batch queries really efficient, for doing batch query really efficient. This query will be very efficient uh, using S-Graph. I get a neighborhood of 5 million vertices instead of one vertex. So the layout of S-Graph is very simple. It's built using S-Frame. For vertex data, we partition into um, a bunch of segments. We call it partitions. In this case, four partitions. Each of the partition is essentially an S-Frame. Remember, S-frame is columnar, disk backed. Therefore, the S-graph is also columnar and disk backed. So vertex, I, <laughs> vertex data, we can store IDs for each vertex. We can associate each ID with um, different types of metadata, like address, zip code. All the column types that's supported by S-array is automatically supported by S-graph. For edges, we similarly partition them into P square as frames. Uh, each partition can store uh, stores a source ID and destination ID and extra metadata like ls bob and message. So the benefit of this partition is that, for example, if I only, uh, for example, partition two and four on the edge only contains vertices from partition two and partition four. This allows, for instance, computing uh, a subgraph. This, this defines a subgraph. And the com any computation on the subgraph only requires to load at most two, S, uh, two, S array, uh, two vertex partitions. And similarly, if I want to look at the neighborhood of vertices in partition two, I only need these edge partitions. No, the rest can be ignored. So finally, because uh, uh, <coughs> S-graph is built on top of S-frame, a direct concatenation of all these vertex S partitions actually gives us a, you, uh, the same view as a tabular data. So we can do our g the vertices page rank, essentially selecting a, the page rank columns of all these S-frames and perform a sum. So you have this seamless transitions between graphs and tables. 
You can do feature engineering on graphs, vertex data, and edge data, like you would do in a, in a simple table, with zero cost, because concatenation or append of two S frames is essentially free. And we build this nice API, which um, minimize the friction of graph feature engineering. So as you can see, these APIs look exactly like tables. G dot vertices, although it's a collection of four S, <coughs> S frames, gives you the same view of a single S frame. However, this layout is not the, uh, not the most efficient. It's still very wasteful. We can see why. Because all these IDs on the edge data are still strings. And the strings can be extremely complex and uh, expensive to work with. It's hard to compress. And we, they are actually a duplicate record of, the, of what we already know about them. So what we can do about it is the implicit, number, <coughs> implicit uh, numbering of the source ID and destination IDs. So each vertex partition actually has an implicit row ID of each record. Therefore, instead of using the actual value of the ID, we use its um, row number local to its own partition. So in this case, uh, Alice is row 0 of partition 1, and Bob is row 1 of partition 1. So in this partition 1, 1, Alice and Bob is replaced by 0 and 1. We can do the same thing for the rest of the record. Now, the entire edge table, source ID, and the <coughs> destination ID columns becomes the integer, which is much uh, easy to compress. So with this compression and uh, S frames, uh, efficient, the efficient external memory table data structure we have, we can actually compress the largest available uh, public graph, common core graph, which has 3.5 billion vertices and uh, 128 billion edges from a two terabyte data set into a 200 gigabyte data set with similar compression ratio of 10 to one. Since this, da this data set is all about um, hyperlinks between pages with no metadata. And it also gives us a very high throughput over the edges. So to compute page rank on a single machine for this big graph, we can uh, achieve the performance of about nine minutes per iteration. And we can compute the entire connected components in less than an hour on a single machine using SSD. There is not any general purpose library today is capable of doing this. OK. That's about this graph. Yes? Uh, so for the for the graph, I think like I think like um you you uh had to like those little things in the world header, um is it because of the 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 bus or do you have the the store the API for the input of the uh the pi bus? Oh, you're talking about uh how do we express computation on graph? Yes, uh so I actually uh skipped a few slides here about uh graph computation for the interest of time. But uh, um, essentially, we, you do a full sweep over the edges. Uh, for each edge, we load two vertices. In the, uh, we have access of uh, two vertex data in the memory. And the vertex data is the current page rank value. And as you uh, iterate through the edges, you, um, you propagate, uh, you send a message, or you perform an operation which changes the value of the target vertex. And this is what we call a triple apply abstraction. In Python, you can define a, a user-defined function called triple apply, which takes three arguments, source vertex, edge data, and destination vertex, and return a triplet like that. Um, and that's a, the that's a computation you would do. Uh, it's defined for a one pass over the graph. You essentially do iterate over this triple apply operation until the page rank is converged. And uh, we have this uh, native implementation in C++ before quickly prototype the Python interface is the, is the easiest one to use. So this is different for uh, like this is the code for C++, you are using Python? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For, for we have a bunch of uh, built-in toolkits uh, for graph analytics, including uh, page rank, label propagation, connected components, uh, triangle counting, and k-core, shortest path, 
they are all implemented in C++, uh, which runs at native speed. Uh, for user-defined computation, you have two choices. One is you write a Python function, which is easy to prototype but run at a slower speed. Uh, or you can use our SDK, uh, which is essentially the same, inter same uh, abstraction and same function signature, but just implementing C++, but you have to compile and uh, import it as a, as, a, as a module, as a shared library module. Well, since, um, since this experiment is S graph, the backend will all be open source. You can, if you want to write uh, the most efficient code and contribute to the open source library, you're more than welcome to. That's a very interesting question, overhead of Python function call. We all know that Python has this um, annoying GIL, right? So you can, you can, you can you, with, within one process, you can run the same, uh, you can run a Python function in parallel. So what we do is we serialize your Python function, and uh, to the back end, we spawn, motive, or we spawn a bunch of uh, new processes we call PyLambda worker. Each worker will receive this serialized function, deserialize it, and then we send data from the main process, the graph lab create process, to the Python process, they run computation, return the, return the result back. So the overhead is actually quite large. It's about, I can see it's about 100x slower than the native C++. But for a graph size of uh, less than, let's say 100,000 edges, one iteration of a triple apply, even implemented in Python, can finish in less than 10 seconds. Yes? It's not a de graph database yeah, at all. Right. It so, but it, so is there something like Python network X? Ah. Network X is it? So network X is this nice mm -hmm. library which implements a lot of graph algorithms and graph visualizations. They essentially have keep the all, to keep the entire edge data structure and the vertex data structure in memory, um, and then they can do a lot of um, in-core computation efficiently. Whereas we are, since we are dealing with external memory, we have to be very careful about how do we partition the graph, how do we access. There's no uh, random access of of the vertices and edges will be as bad as random access on S3. So uh, getting a single neighborhood, if you want to implement a graph visualization library on top of that, on top of S graph, you have to do additional caching yourself because uh, jumping around on the text table is usually not the best thing you can do. Okay. Um, now we have, <coughs> we have talked about uh, efficient uh, data structures for single machine. How do we extend them to distributed? See, for single machine, given that this data set with two columns in X or Y, for example, say we can do a one pass over, over it in 100 seconds. And when you have distributed multiple machines, each, each machine gets half of the data. You essentially have parallel disk, and the one pass cost is reduced to half. So having an external mem good external memory uh, data structure for a single machine still be uh, <coughs> will still be very helpful even when you go to distributed setting. But not, not all, um, a lot of uh, machine learning algorithms are not embarrassingly parallel like this. For example, in distributed uh, complex optimization, like Newton algorithm, uh, uh, LBFGS gradient descent, what you have is you do a parallel sweep over the data to compute a gradient, and then you exchange the parameters <coughs> to, to, to synchronize, and then you do this over and over again. So in addition to have efficient uh, external memory data structure to speed up the first part, we also need to make sure the data is evenly split 
and also we can we need to <coughs> push the performance of the network co uh, communication layer so that they talk as less as possible and talk as quickly as possible. So we begin uh, with disk on HDFS, and each machine will first save uh, uh, part of the data onto its local SSD for more efficient iterative passing. And then we implement a very uh, <coughs> a high performance uh, intercommunication layer, RPC, um, to do the communication quickly. So the benchmark on the full critical data set was 4.4 billion rows and 14 coefficients. We achieve a nearly uh, linear speed up. You can finish. Um, this is run through convergence, by the way. This is not a number for one iteration. Uh, on 16 machine, we can run through to convergence in just a few minutes. How do we distribute the graphs? This is even more interesting because it's <coughs> it's it, it's even less embarrassingly parallel. Graphs has co these constraints about vertex and edges, and we have to partition the graph. So graph partitioning, uh, the objective is to minimize the communication. Essentially, <coughs> the number of uh, machines that a vertex spans defines how much communication you need to do for that vertex. So we want to uh, have as few, uh, has as few uh, replication of each vertex as possible. And the graph, uh, graph partitioning is a really, really difficult problem. And the two just uh, just to do that alone may be more expensive than your original task. So what we do is a uh, simple heuristic and effective partitioning strategy with zero cost. So remember we have S graphs edges as partitioned into P square numbers. Now each machine only takes <coughs> takes uh, one partition or one fourth of the partition. Because of this uh, constraint, grid constraint, each vertex can span no more than two square root, root of p of partition. For example, the part vertices in partition, uh, in partition, vertex partition one only exists on these partitions. So they will show up on no more than uh, two square root of p minus one machines, assuming you have as many machines as the number of partitions you have. So we found out in practice this is good enough than running a complicated optimization algorithm for distributed graph partitioning just to bring that replication factor even lower. So this is the slide uh, from two or three years ago where the power graph claims that it does um, page rank on a Yahoo Alta Vista graph with six billion edges in under seven seconds per, per iteration. That's about one billion edges processed per second. And today with the new uh, external memory data structure and graph partitioning ideas, we can run on an even bigger graph, common crawl, with 180 billion edges, with 16 machines only, at, uh, uh, at 45 seconds per iteration. That's three billion edges per second. So in summary, we talked about external memory data structures that is the key to the productivity in data science. We have talked about ways to scale to terabytes of data on just a single machine. And when you extend these learnings from single machine to distributed, you can run even faster and scale to even larger data sets. So people often ask me about uh, what do you learn from system that can apply to machine learning, and what do you learn from machine learning that applies to system. These are, this is a very good example, which I think I want to share with you. So we want to understand the system storage hierarchy that's from system side. And we also want to understand the memory access pattern of graphs, uh, of algorithms that's from the algorithm and machine learning side. We want to combine them together so that we <coughs> We want to combine them together so that we can have um, we can build systems that is um, designed for machine learning. So finally, this is my final slide. Um, 
So we have gone back, uh, we have gone from a distributed uh, graph computation five years ago back to a single machine as frame, and now back to distributed. Uh, what we have learned. So speeding up performance on a single machine, we call it scale up. And uh, adding more machines doing distributed, we call it scale out. Um, it's not just about speed or scaling. It is easy to throw more and more machines to uh, tackle bigger and bigger problems and, uh, or run faster to be some benchmark. Um, at Data, we are not doing that. We w it's all about doing more with what you already have. Okay, thanks. Uh, the data structure, uh, S-frame and S-graph, S-array, will be open source. The machine learning uh, algorithms we build on top of it will be not. For example, uh, recommender system, uh, deep learning neural net are not uh, going to open source. But we are, but we are distribution yeah. Distribution will also be part of that? Distributed. The, the distribution of the nodes across different, uh, ah. of the graph across different nodes. Uh, distributed will not be open sourced. NumPy is a good question. We're still heavily debated, debating it internally. I hope it will be open source, but I can't say it uh, right now. So with this uh, um, good data structure open source, we're looking for a machine learning community to develop more and more uh, external memory friendly algorithms. There are a few of them right now. For instance, the XGBoost um, by Tianqi Chen, uh, which is essentially a super fast uh, uh, open source library for gradient boosted tree. Um, he actually has an external memory version. Uh, I'm talking to him for integrating with S-frames. We're looking for more and more uh, things like that. Also, Scikit-learn. <laughs> <What? coughs> An interesting uh, story about this NumPy is after we did this NumPy uh, hack, uh, we have this very large NumPy array, and we want to do some experiments on it with Scikit-learn. We had a hard time finding uh, interesting algorithms that can actually scale on that NumPy array. We have found uh, SGD without shuffle works. PCA actually works, um, but the other algorithms are either too com uh, the complexity is too high by themselves, like n square algorithms. We're not even going to try them. But even for our n log n or n or n algorithms, some of them are uh, heavily have heavy random access, which just doesn't work. On even even you have a good external memory data structure. Oh, if you want to learn about that crazy NumPy hack that you did, uh, I can talk about it afterward, offline. All right, thanks.